Lord, I pray you will take the words of my mouth, the meditations, Lord, of my heart and our hearts, our mind, our will, and emotions. And Lord, may they be pleasing in your sight because you are indeed the one who is our rock and you are our redeemer. And we praise you. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all his people say, amen. Now, when we say amen, I have neglected to explain, and some people were asking me about that. You realize that amen means you're in agreement, right? It's just like saying, so be it. And so when I say at the end, and all of you say amen, you can say praise the Lord or other things, but basically the amen just means you're in agreement with what we've been praying. And so when we join with each other, and I love the way that song said, you know, it doesn't take many of us, just two or three coming together in his name, and he promises to be there with us. Hallelujah. So when we come together, we want to have this sense of his presence with us, and I trust you'll have that. So the Lord is risen. Okay, well, I caught you yeah, a little bit by surprise there. The Lord is risen. <laughs> Thank you, Ezekiel. Do you realize that when we do that, we're remembering, of course, the resurrection. And this now is Pentecost, 50 days later, and the Lord kept his promise. And to that you can say hallelujah. Because when the Lord keeps his promise, when the Lord makes a promise, he keeps it. So he said he would give us his Holy Spirit, and he gave it to us. But not only did he give us this Holy Spirit, but as we come together like this, we're celebrating the giving of the Holy Spirit so we could do the happy birthday church that we just did. But there's three elements up there for us to kind of understand. We have to be open to receiving the Holy Spirit. God pours it out. We say that when we become a believer, the Holy Spirit comes into our life. And I've used this illustration before, but... The Holy Spirit is not the kind of guest that you usually think about inviting into your house because the Holy Spirit isn't content to just stay at the door. The Holy Spirit wants to go through your whole life. Isn't that exciting? He opens cupboards, closets. He checks everything out because he wants control of your life. So you see, that's when we receive him, we also have to click in that next part, which is really hard for us, particularly in the West and particularly in America. It's called surrender. You know, surrender means giving up your right, your control, your authority to yourself. And when we receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's asking us to surrender to him. And that means we don't know what the future may hold, but we know who holds the future. Yeah, and that's the good news. And then we want to cultivate. And uh, June, I don't know if you'll remember this, but when I preached a series or just a message when Pastor Bobby was still here about the soils, and you talked about, I should have probably have talked about pulling some weeds, remember? Uh, because when we bear fruit, there are things which Jesus tells us that come in and prevent us from having the fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. Ah, let's see if you can say them with me, okay? So I know translations vary, but let's just try it. So the first three you should have, love, joy, peace, okay? Next three, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Oh, you all did very well. Give yourself a hand. You see, we want to cultivate the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And when we cultivate the fruit of the Holy Spirit, we're going to see what the Lord wants to do in your life and in mine. And I don't know about you, but when I look at the fruit of the Spirit, you know, I find out that there are some aspects of that fruit that aren't quite as strong as other aspects. And it's really interesting. The word that's used here is a collective noun. So it means that we have this idea that we aren't supposed to just concentrate on one aspect of our fruit, but we're supposed to work on all aspects. Okay? 
So keep that in mind as we go through our message this morning with you. We'll come back. We'll review some of this. So this is from last week. If you have your Bibles, this is Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 22 to 24. But I've actually put it on the slide for you, even though I told you I wouldn't do those kinds of things. But we want to go ahead and just see what this scripture has to say for us. And let's read it together. And you'll notice we did this before. We were looking at all the times that the twos are used, right? So let's try it. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Now, the reason I wanted to use that this morning is not just to review what we had talked about last week, but that's where we're going. And that's what we already have as well. We live in what's called an in-between time, a both end. Do you know the Lord is with us right now? Amen? Amen. But there's coming a day, what we talk about is a day of the Lord, when we go to be with him. That's going to be a great day, okay? If you don't believe me, read your Bibles. It's a great day. But in the meantime, we occupy. We, and we're going to hear this more in the message. Did you know this world's not my home? Yeah. <laughs> we're just passing through. We're pilgrims on the way. And, you know, if you stop to think about what you and I get so worried and concerned about, you realize that this is just transitory. It means it's not going to last. It's going to pass away. I've got a heavenly kingdom I'm going to, but I don't want to become so heavenly minded that I'm no. Can you complete it? Oh, how'd you know that? You see, we, can, we need to recognize that God wants us to be good occupiers. The word that he uses, and Jonathan, you reminded us of this when you did communion on Good Friday. He wants us to be good stewards. That is the way we live, the things we say, think, and do. Now, let's go on to that next slide. So, we want to do the celebrating again of the Holy Spirit. And now you picked up on the three main verbs. You receive the Holy Spirit, okay? You surrender to the Holy Spirit, and you cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. Got it? Good. Okay. Now let's go a little bit more into Hebrews 13. By the way, in Hebrews 13, we're not going to find the Holy Spirit talked about, but it's implied. Holy Spirit is mentioned three times in the book of Hebrews. Chapter 3, chapter 9, chapter 10. Each of the times it's talked about in which the Holy Spirit will testify or speak or interpret. The Holy Spirit in your life and in mine wants to talk to us. Okay? Okay. Do you know what's essential for us if a person wants to talk to us? Mike, how'd you know that? Did, the, did, the Linnea, did Linnea tell you that? <laughs> so usually it's our spouses that remind us that we have to listen. If they're talking, we're supposed to be paying attention. Hear what they're saying to us. Yeah, can you say amen? Even a weak amen? <laughs> That the whole concept for us here is to recognize what God wants to do in your life and in mine by helping us to listen when he's speaking to us. Now, if you keep this, com keep this concept in mind, we also need to recognize the Holy Spirit is a person. Now, I don't usually recommend books to you, but there is a book by uh, Francis Chan called The Forgotten God. It's a very good book, if you haven't read it recently. And it's the forgotten God is the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason we, in our tradition, and I say within the German evangelical church tradition, we've not talked a lot about the Holy Spirit. Do you know why? 
Because the Holy Spirit, if you talk too much about the Holy Spirit, you might start doing things that aren't in the program. <laughs> it's true. Because the Holy Spirit, I think I told you one time when I was pastoring at another church at a staff meeting, and we had things all lined out time-wise, and the visitation pastor, Clarence Knepley, who had been superintendent, asked me, he said, Bill, what happens if the Holy Spirit shows up? <laughs> What, what happens to our time schedule? Well, I don't know about you. I like to be organized. And believe it or not, I do kind of watch the clock. I watch it as it moves. Uh, but we need to recognize the way in which God wants us to be open to the Spirit's leading. And brothers and sisters, the Spirit does not always work on our timetable. It doesn't work in our way. Now, it doesn't mean we're not to be organized. It just means we need to be listening to the Holy Spirit. Well, it's very interesting the way that when we get into this study of Hebrews 13, because what we find out is that the Holy Spirit, did you know the Holy Spirit's a person? We find out in Ephesians we can grieve the Holy Spirit. In Thessalonians, we're told we can quench the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But do you know that unlike the Father and Son, there's nothing in the scripture where the Holy Spirit is seeking praise for itself? Did you know that? The Holy Spirit only seeks for praise to God and the Son. Now talk about a great example of humility. Now that doesn't mean we can't thank God for the Holy Spirit and there are songs where we praise the Holy Spirit. But this, uh, the central element I want you to understand, particularly as we get into this chapter, is that the Holy Spirit isn't seeking to glorify itself. And I think Hebrews 13 helps us understand this because you don't find the Holy Spirit mentioned, but you see the results of having the fruit of the Spirit. And so let's look at a few of these together. First of all, you'll see we start off in chapter 13 with a phileo, a uh, word that you may not be familiar with, but you probably have heard before. Let love of the brethren continue. Any of you ever heard of the city of brotherly love? Do you know what it is? Philadelphia. And that's where you see that word phileo used. It's supposed to... <laughs> Did she just catch you, Kevin? <laughs> so, you see, this is an advantage that when I'm too relaxed with you and then I make these personal comments. I'm sorry for those of you who are at home because you could be here and I could do this with you too. <laughs> so the idea is that it's, phileo means we love each other. There's a sense in which when we love one another, we care deeply about each other so much that when one person hurts, we hurt with them. When one person rejoices, we rejoice with them. That's the idea of brotherly love. But he doesn't stop there. This is another element of the fruit. Don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Do you realize the mark of the early church was hospitality? Um, I never get the Spanish quite right here, so you can help me out, Kevin. What is it? Uh, my house is your house? Mia casa, sia casa, or something like that? Sua casa, okay. So the, the sense is that when we talked about this being his home, we want hospitality. We want to entertain people. It's okay. Okay, you, you aren't quite catching this. I, we, we tend to have our, a mentality, and I'm right here, where our home is kind of our castle. And we may not have a real moat or a drawbridge, but sometimes letting people in past the front door is a real effort. So understanding hospitality, because by this, guess what? You can entertain an angel. Now, I'm not guaranteeing all your guests will be angels, but yes, yeah, what he talks about. So hospitality. But now look what else he goes to. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who are ill-treated since you yourself also are in the body. There's a prison ministry that the Gideons have with the Clackamas uh, prison or the Clackamas jail. 
that's just one I know about. I know McLaren has an opening of one of our pastors. Randy Butler has been involved with them. Uh, why do we visit prisoners? Okay. Because they need visitors. <laughs> they need to hear the gospel, the good news. There are so many good ministries going on right now. In Colombia, one of the largest ministries going on is among prisoners. And we're seeing whole prisons transformed as a result of that. Did you know the mark of the early Methodist church, John and Charles Wesley, and why they were called Methodists? Because they visit the prisons. And in John and Charles Wesley's day, if you were in debt, you went to prison. That's where we get the term debtor's prison. And they visited these poor people, and sometimes it was the whole family in prison. So the idea was to visit the prisoners. Now, this is the fruit of the Spirit operating for us. Now, I'm going to throw a bit of a twist here because Scripture is pretty clear. It's talking about real prisoners. But do you know that because of COVID, there are prisoners in their own homes? People are kind of fearful. Brothers and sisters, I have good news. You are not excited about this. <laughs> The good news is that in Jesus, we don't have fear. And we have good news, healthy news, whole news to share with people. Do you know there are people who are really longing just to have somebody give them a call? Just to even spend time to talk with them? Diana and I were visiting with some folks in Hope Village and to realize how people can become so isolated and they become prisoners. Let's set the prisoner free. Amen? Because that's what Jesus did for you and me. Hallelujah. Okay, so we can get fired up a bit. Did you know marriage, this is the next area he hits. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? Moves from brotherly love to hospitality to visiting prisoners. And now he says, marriage is to be held in honor. Now, not that I'm suggesting that marriage is like prison. Uh, <laughs> But marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers. God will judge. Hey, it means when we get married, we've made a commitment, and we honor the commitment. Will we face temptations? Yes. And what do we do? We say no. We stay committed. So, now, having covered those four areas, which you can understand, still cultivating fruit of the Spirit, he goes on because he doesn't stop there. Because remember again, this is showing us life controlled by the Spirit will produce fruit of the Spirit. So look at what happens with verse 5. This is where it's very interesting to me. You know, in our culture today, you can hear more talk about sex than you do about money. So listen to what he does next. If you got your Bibles, you got it. Make sure your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we can confidently say, what? The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Do you understand here? He's not saying money is bad. What he's saying is the love of money. That's the issue. It's where money becomes our God. Where money becomes what we serve. And this is exactly the point of when Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount, about Matthew 6. You can't have two gods. And he calls the one mammon, which is a love of material things. You remember that one of the weeds, June, going back to your comment, that you made one of the weeds is cares of the world. Do you have any cares of the world? <laughs> yes, because we live in the world, we have cares. But we can't let those cares dictate to us what we do. We don't serve the cares. We serve a God who understands all our cares. Hallelujah. Good news. But that's not all he goes on to talk about here. And well, I should just conclude this too. Notice the promise. The reason we can be content is because no matter where we go or what we have, God is with us. 
should, amen, should remind you of Christmas. Remember Emmanuel? What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Yes, very good. Well, that's not the only thing he's going to talk about. So let's go on to the next one. And I especially have to comment on this because the first thing he talks about is leaders. And I would say this even if I wasn't uh, serving as your interim pastor. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and consider the results of their conduct, imitate their faith. Let me tell you, every time I read that, I have further challenge for myself because it's really easy for me to tell you, follow Paul. But when I say imitate my faith, now I have to check my own life. Do you realize that Paul says that you and I are letters that people are reading? Yeah, you can check it out. It's in Corinthians. So what we find out is that Paul recognizes that you and I, with the Holy Spirit in our life, we're supposed to radiate Jesus. That's why you can say here, imitate the leader. Don't be carried, or and Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. Can you complete it? Today and forever. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's true. Do you realize that everything, many of you are older than I am, and a lot of you are still younger, believe it or not. Do you realize you've seen a lot of things change? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's a constancy to our Lord. And look at the last part here. Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by, it doesn't matter your translation, be strengthened by what? Grace. Hallelujah. Not by foods through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. You see, part of what he wants you and me to recognize here is that our hearts, our mind, our will, and emotion need to be strengthened by grace. Now, what we're going to do is a little different now, but you, you can hang in there with me. I want to go to the next slide, and we're going to do some praying here. We're going to interrupt the message I, for just a moment. Well, probably more than a moment, <laughs> a couple of minutes anyway. Hebrews 13, giving us this picture of life in the Spirit, Jesus says that he's come, and this is if you turn with me now still in chapter 13. Therefore, Jesus, verse 12, that he sanctified, that is, made holy the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. That was in the hymn we were singing about the church's one foundation. So let us go to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach, for here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Yeah, the city which is to come. And that's why we're pilgrims. Well, what I want to do is we're going to see a, a short 30 second, and it is very short, so you have to pay attention. Unlike me talking, this is short, so pay attention. That's Francis Chan, by the way. Lord, I want to thank you that you told us before you went to be with the Father that you gave us what we call the Great Commission, that you wanted us to be your disciples, that your desire for us was knowing that you were with us, was to go into all the world and teaching, preaching, baptizing, being involved in helping people become your disciples. Lord, there are three billion people today who have not yet heard your word. And Lord, I don't know who you may be speaking to in our congregation, 
There may be some, Lord, that you're actually preparing to go to the mission field. And that may be not just here, but in ho- at the homes, too, that are tuned in. Lord, there are some who may be challenged to go ahead and give more, to connect with missionaries who are working with the unreached. Lord, you know all of those things. I just ask that as a congregation, you will help us to pray for the unreached. And Lord, as I say that, I'm aware that right here in our own neighborhood, right here in Canby, right here wherever you are uh, tuned in from, there are people in your neighborhood who do not know Jesus. They've never read the Bible. And Lord, that seems so strange to us. How could that possibly happen? And yet, Lord, we know it's true. So help us to reach the unreached. And then, Lord, when I pray like that, it just makes me think of the prayer that you taught the disciples, your disciples. And, Lord, we want to share in that prayer together. And when we come to debts and trespasses, we're going to substitute sin. And when we are used to praying, deliver us from evil, We're going to pray, pray, deliver us from the evil one. Evil makes it kind of a general statement, but we have a real adversary, and it's the evil one. It's Satan. So, as Jesus taught his disciples when they asked him to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And all his people say, Amen. 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 I actually don't know. I tried to study the history behind the trespasses and debts. And if you've ever done the Lord's Prayer in other settings, you know some want to say trespasses, some say debts. The word trespass is actually translated sin uh, in other translations. And I can't help but think when we use debts, we tend to focus in our culture on money. Uh, And the trespass, it's like, you know, I have this that I belong, we we need to catch very much that what the Lord is teaching his disciples is a prayer about asking forgiveness for sin and recognizing that we as people who represent Jesus, when people violate or hurt Jesus, they hurt us. You all kind of catch this? So anyway, that's enough teaching. Let's go on to the next part. Okay. Look at what happens that when we go, this is so beautiful, this is starting verse 15. Through him, let us continually, this is another one of those vegetable verses, the let us, continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. This is so in keeping with other verses that Paul wrote about too. Do you see, brothers and sisters, How often does praise come to your lips? Are you known for being a praiser? A person who just offers praise to God. And that's actually the fruit of your lips. But it's not just this. Look what else. Do not neglect doing good and sharing. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Now I have to use a couple of illustrations here. Do you know wives sometimes are good teachers? Husbands are supposed to say yes, okay? Do you know, uh, one of the things I had a hard time doing when we were going to seminary, this is a long time ago, Ezekiel, Charity, way before, probably before you were born. So back in 1974, the Lord gave us a call to go to seminary. Yeah, long time ago. (laughs) Everybody here is just laughing. So... But you know, some people wanted to give us money to, because they knew we were coming down. 
And it was really hard for me to accept the money. And Diana said, this is where I needed to listen to my wife. Diana said, you know, you need to receive it graciously because it's a blessing for them to give it. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And Diana, and we've seen this in our own life. As you know, we serve as missionaries. We have some people who provide support for us, physical, but mainly prayer support. When people pray for you, they give you a gift. I don't know about you, but even when I've been a miser and I haven't wanted to do it, God has still blessed me anyway. Okay, now you didn't catch that. <laughs> you see, when we give, we get a blessing back. When we don't receive what a person wants to give us, we deprive them of a blessing. You with me? Okay. Part of the reason I want to, us to understand this is I think God is going to be challenging the can-be evangelical church to even be more of a giving church. What do we give to our community? What does God want you and me to be involved in giving? Uh, and not just the giving, but the sharing. Remember, we've had lots of things that we've done for Canby Center, the backpack things. You know, those are good activities. That's sharing with your community. Sharing with your neighbors. Do you know, this goes back to the COVID thing, neighbors have needs. Do you know what the needs of the neighbors are? Do you know that in order to know their needs, it helps to know their names? <laughs> helps to knock on doors. Not because you want something, but because you want to give something. Okay? So the sharing, the giving that's talked about here, just really powerful. Do not neglect doing good and sharing because that's the kind of sacrifices God's pleased with. Hallelujah. Good news for us. But, and I know some of you are saying, okay, Bill, it's time. So here we go. Look at verse 17. Now, I couldn't omit this. This is the advantage, by the way, of doing book studies. You may remember Pastor Bobby talking about this. When you do a book study, you end up covering topics that are really good, and people might think you're pointing a finger at them, but just here it says, Obey your leaders. Submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Now, there's another reason why you don't want to move into leadership easily. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this was beyond profitable for you. <laughs> so in other words, don't cause your leaders grief. Pray for them. Make them, charity, you like that. <laughs> so the idea is for us to be involved in blessing our leaders. And I'm not just talking about myself. I believe the Lord is preparing a pastor for us. When that pastor comes, we want to bless him. Amen? Okay, good. Got a few amens. Pray for us, for we're sure we have a good conscience desiring our, to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. It ends with this sense of praying. And whoever the writer is, I urge you all the more to do this so that I may be restored to you the sooner. It sounds like they may be in prison, held up some way. Brothers and sisters, God is challenging you and me to share the fruit of the Spirit in very practical ways. And this chapter so well illustrates that. But then it closes with this great benediction, which I've been using for several Sundays, so it's not new to you. But I want us to look at it very carefully because it's a powerful benediction. Now, the God of peace, and I'm going to go ahead and we'll pray this. I'll pray this at the end of the service. But I want you to understand what it says. Now, the God of peace, the God of shalom, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep. Who's the great shepherd of the sheep? Okay, let's try this again. Who's the great shepherd of the sheep? Jesus. He brought Jesus through the blood of the eternal covenant. Even Jesus, our Lord, equip you, notice this, equip you in every good thing to do his will. Working in us that which is what? Pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be what? 
the glory forever and ever. Hallelujah. What a wonderful way to conclude Pentecost Sunday.